this morning. I have some good news for you today, and it's going to be so easy for our hearts to receive this word because for the last couple of weeks, we've been hearing about hope, and hopefully God has opened up the window of hope and shined into your heart the last couple of weeks because there is a lot to be hopeful about in our lives. Amen? Amen. If you've been watching Fox News or CNN or reading social media, you're not finding much hope. But I'm telling you, in the Word of God, there's a whole lot of hope. And I'm going to share with you this morning why God wants us to hope and dream once again. I have the privilege of sharing not just this Sunday, but next Sunday too, on hopes and dreams. And uh, uh, God has given me prophetic uh, giftings. And I really have prayed and sought him. And I really believe that this word is from him. So this morning, since we have such short time, this is going to be more of the intro that's going to whet your appetite to come back next week too. So it's going to give you, but I'm going to give you some good meat this morning. And I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. So today on the last Sunday of 2021 and the next Sunday, the first Sunday of 2022, we are going to hope and we are going to dream with God. Are you guys ready? I'm ready because his dreams are much bigger than my dreams, aren't they? He's got big dreams for you. You know, we live in such a different era of any other time in history. And uh, there's just been nothing like this. I took humanities in college for four semesters. And it shows as you study the history of the world how it kind of goes in a cycle of repeating itself one after another. But this last generation, I believe this is the generation that will usher in the King of Kings, is so different like any other. And Jesus talked a lot about it. And yes, I do believe that we live in the end times and we need to live like Jesus is coming back today because so many things are happening so rapidly. Um, If you just look at the last, oh, probably 30 or 40 years, there's been a philosophy that has been taught through our school system and on the media and and just all over. It's infiltrated literally the whole planet, and that is a humanistic view that we ourselves is where we find our own self-worth. And uh, social media has fed that because so many people are looking for their self-worth and value on how many followers they have or how many likes they have on social media. And it's just the heart of the of a human, of you, men and women, young and old, it's our heart that longs to be discovered, to be celebrated, to be valued, to be tweeted, to be mentioned, to be liked, to be known. It's in our hearts to do that. God put it there. The problem is, is that we can never in our in our, of ourselves find that fulfillment. We can only find our fulfillment and worth, our true value in our creator, God himself. And so... In this era, somehow we need to help the world find what it's longing for, find who they really are, and find their purpose at the foot of the cross. You know, the world is changing fast. I mean, if you could rewind 24 months, just back 24 months, you know, they say BC is now before COVID, but it is really before Christ. (laughs) But uh, before COVID and all the other things that have happened in our lives, it's at such a fast pace of constant change that is going on. Kevin was showing me yesterday that in the midst of Christmas, you may not have known that we actually successfully launched a satellite yesterday that's going four times further than any satellite has ever gone in just a matter of five months. And in six months, we will be getting pictures of parts of our universe that we have never seen before with incredible accuracy. I mean, the things that are being accomplished today, technology, everything is changing so quickly. To sum it up, our society is is basically get what you want, who you want, how you want it, as fast as you want it. It's just fast, fast, fast. It talks almost faster than me. And so I know a few of you can talk faster than me, though. We've come to expect that everything is just a click away. One minute, I'll Google it. Order overnight deliveries. Didn't we all enjoy that for Christmas? Take a pill. You'll feel better instantly. Binge TV. That's what a lot of us are going to be doing this afternoon. I'm one of them in front of the fireplace. I'm going to binge TV. I can watch an entire season of my favorite series in one afternoon. Are you guys, I know it's awful, but I'm going to do it. Buttered popcorn and all. It's coming. You know, companies are aggressively competing against one another so that we, the consumer, can avoid any delays to our gratification. And that feeds us every single day. Uber, I can get a ride in minutes. DoorDash, I can get whatever I want to eat within within an hour. Spotify, any music I want to listen to at my fingertips. Dating apps, here you go, singles. Dating apps, within a click, you can find thousands of people that are candidates for your love and affection. (laughs) We 
have become so impatient that we won't even sit through commercials on TV. Are you that way? I'll click it or change it or I'll, or I'll have to record it. So I will not. I don't even know what commercials are on TV anymore because I do not watch them. Don't get me wrong, guys. New technology is very helpful. And this is a wonderful privileged day that we live in. But there is a price to pay for that privilege. And we cannot be naive that the current trends of the world we live in right now are recklessly glorifying our selfish self. We feel so important when we're instantly served and satisfied. I was telling Kevin, I feel very important when I go to Nordstrom's because I'm right and they're wrong, no matter what. I can return all the things I want at Nordstrom's without a question, without a heartache. I can go to the bathroom and sit on the couch and talk to everybody all day long because it's so beautiful. It's like a living room in the women's restroom at Nordstrom's. It's like, you know... But we feel so important when we're satisfied so quickly and so fully and so easily. And the danger is, will we choose to be cherished and loved by an eternal God? Are we going to seek the satisfaction of the temporary applause of man? Are we going to seek the everlasting or the temporary in the instant? Do you know that God has high hopes and dreams for you? That you live during this era for a reason. You were chosen to live in this generation. And God has a purpose and a plan for you, a big dream. This is why I love New Year so much, because it helps me recalibrate calibrate and refocus and pray and get in sync with a God who's dreaming bigger dreams than I am dreaming for myself. I want to be in sync with God, and I want to hope, and I want to dream with him once again. So to learn more about this, we're going to go to Genesis this morning, and we're going to do this in 15, 20 minutes, so I hope you guys are ready. You know a lot about the story of Joseph. Joseph was a guy that got the raw end of the deal, I mean the short end of the stick. I always say things the wrong way, so forgive me for that. I always always try to take two sayings and put them together in one bowl of, I don't know. Anyway, but Joseph was the son of a man named Jacob, and Jacob was the great-grandson of Abraham and the son of Isaac. So there was Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph. And we find his story in chapter 39. If you want to go there with me in Genesis, it'll be up on the screen behind me too. But Jacob had many, many sons, but he had a favorite son named Joseph. And Joseph, he gave his coat of many colors to. And the brothers did not like the favoritism that their dad showed toward Joseph. And so when Joseph started sharing about a dream that God had given him, and he started boasting about how God was going to use him, his brothers were even more infuriated and jealous of him to the point they betrayed their father. They take him out in the middle of nowhere, throw him in a pit. They get him out of the pit. They sell him into slavery. Then they go home and they lie to their dad and say, Joseph is dead. They would rather see their father's heart broken in half than to live one more minute with little Joseph in the house. It's a very sad story. But let me tell you, before you start feeling bad for Joseph, Joseph far away from home, betrayed by his brothers. I mean, he had to be brokenhearted. He's now serving as a slave in a foreigner's house. And there in that place, the Bible says, and this is where we're going to pick it up, Genesis 39 2, the Lord was with Joseph. He wasn't alone. This is such good news. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. I love this. Oh, we could just stay on this verse all day long because when the Lord is with you, you succeed. You have such favor, and it's just that cherry on top. He succeeded in everything he did as he served the home of his Egyptian master. So even in obscurity, in that hidden place, God was with Joseph. Now, if you fast forward the story, again, Joseph gets betrayed, and he is falsely accused of a crime that he doesn't commit. He's thrown into prison, and in prison, another obscure and hidden place, we find out that God is still with Joseph. Fast forward to verse 21, 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison, and he showed him his faithful love, and the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. I just like to take out Joseph's name and put that in there. But the Lord was with Cindy. The Lord was with with Linda. The Lord was with Leah. The Lord was, was with Sergio. In the prison, God showed up with his faithful love, and he made them successful. I love this. Joseph interprets a few dreams of his fellow prisoners, and that gets him noticed to where he goes before even the king, Pharaoh, 
and he's going to interpret the king's dreams. And the result, fast forwarding to the end, I'm giving you the little short version. Joseph is promoted to the second most powerful person in the land, in the world that day. He was prime minister of Egypt. Psalms 105, 19 sums up my lesson today. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Psalms 105, verse 19. This little verse tells me two truths that I want us all to know today. One, God fulfills dreams. God, what are you dreaming? Come on, guys. What were you dreaming last January? God fulfills dreams. And number two, God is patient. He's not in the same hurry the rest of our world is. And he is patient. And in the process of a dream being fulfilled. He who is faithful is faithful to complete what he has started in you. 1 Thessalonians 5.24. And then the verse that Caleb, led by the Holy Spirit, shared with us today. Philippians 1.6. 6, I am certain that God will finish what he has started in me. Unlike the world we live in, God is not in a hurry. He is patient. And he's going to take us to where he is dreaming us to go. I've been in church for many years. I've heard a lot of encouraging verses and passages and sermons and poems and stories about how God is going to break through right now. He's going to bring a miracle right now. He's going to send revival right now. And I enjoy all of those because God does act in the sudden moments. It says, and suddenly there appeared an angel in the sky, right? We hear of the suddenlies of the Bible. But you guys, we also need to accept that God also works until. He's not just in the right now. He's also in the until. And God is saying to us this morning, until he moves, until he answers, until he heals, until he provides, we need to keep hoping. We need to keep praying. We need to keep being faithful to the one who is faithful to us. We need to keep believing until God says it's the right time for fulfillment of the dream. Until the time comes to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. I love that verse. When we learn to submit to the process of waiting for God's timing, when we submit to the process of God working inside of us so that he can work through us to fulfill his purposes, let me tell you, God is going to be glorified in a way that is so much bigger than anything you're dreaming for yourself. While the world waits for everything right now, we want everything right now. We have to deprogram ourselves to understand and embrace and trust a God who will not bring it until it is time. Until now. Until now. That's how God works with us. We're faithful. We get up the next day. We're faithful. We get up the next day. We're faithful. And then one day we get up and we're fruitful. And we begin to see the fulfillment of our dreams. I had a prophetic dream that I'll share with you more about it next week as we start the new year. But the gist of it was the Lord was showing me that the best is not yet to come, that we are living in the best this year, that the best is here. And I'm telling you, I feel it in my bones. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. You know, I was in a tornado once when I was a little girl, and the tornado zoomed around us with all the trash and debris and chaos, but in the middle was the eye of the storm. And I believe that that's where the church of God is, that he is going to sustain us, that if we're in the prison, he is there. If we're in the pit, he is there. If we're in the palace, he is there. He is with us. And as long as we're in sync with him in the eye of the storm, that we're not troubled with what's going on around us, but that our eyes and our, and our rest and our peace and our hope and our faith it resides in him, I'm telling you, the best is here. The best is here. He's dreaming some big dreams for us. And to get there, we're going to have to embrace the untils until we get to the now. We've got to know that God won't take us to the big dreams that he has for us where we'll fall to the weight of a... to our knees because it's more than we could ever handle. You see, Joseph had his dream when he was 17 years old. And I'm telling you, he was not ready to be prime minister of Egypt at that time. He wasn't. But God loved him so much that he said, Joseph, I'm going to get you ready for it. In fact, the whole nation of Israel, do you know that within a month of leaving Egypt, they stood on the shoreline and could see the promised land? And God said, because I know they're not ready for it, 
I will take them around another way. 40-year detour, they thought. No, God was preparing them. God was equipping them. God was a potter who was shaping them and molding them so that when they got to the promised land, they wouldn't forget who their God is. I'm telling you, the best is coming, and we're going to be ready for it because we're going to embrace the until, until the dream is fulfilled. Amen? So in the process of waiting, our character is being developed. Without character, we cannot handle the dreams that God has for us. We can't. That's just the God honest truth. You see, the weight of your dreams will crush you if your character is not there to hold it up. The world says, be great. The world says, you are great if you do great things that we can see. But God says you're great when we learn valuable lessons in the hidden places. Do great things before the eyes of people. That just requires your charisma, your good looks. But to do great things before the eyes of your God, that requires character. And hidden lessons that we learn on the inside will eventually work their way to the outside by God fulfilling his dreams. For Joseph, God would watch him, and he would see how he served in the hidden, obscure places. Would he interpret the dreams of the butler? Would he interpret the dreams of the baker before he would interpret the dreams of the king? Yes, he did. Would Joseph have the character to sustain him for his dream ahead? See, if you're living without character, this is what your life looks like. You're self-confident. You're making decisions without regarding anyone else but yourself. You enjoy power. You seek personal reward and recognition. You operate independent of the Holy Spirit. Oh, that one hurts. Because I got up Monday and, and, I, and I rushed off to work and I forgot to submit to the Holy Spirit. See, we need to get in sync with the Holy Spirit. That's what character does. When we operate in the virtue of character, you're confident, not in yourself, but you're confident in God. Remember what Philippians 1.6 that Caleb just shared? I am certain that God will do what he said he will do. Not, I'm not certain that Cindy's going to get the job done. Okay? Because when we have character, what happens is Joseph goes before the king, and he declares, oh, king, God can interpret your dream. He never points to himself as part of the solution. He doesn't say, oh, God works in me. I can, I can tell you what your dream means. He says, no, God can tell you what your dream means. He didn't look to his own talents. He didn't look to his own ability. He didn't look to his experience. He didn't look to his status quo. He said, you know what? God and God alone. That's what character does. That's what happens in the waiting. In the process of us waiting and God shaping us and molding us is that we learn, you know what? I can't do this without God. I'm telling you right now, the people around you that are successful or appear to be successful or that God is using mightily, I'm telling you right now, in their mind and in their heart, sure, sure that way with me, we're like, I wonder if anybody's ever going to find out how little I really do know. I wonder if anybody's going to find out how limited I really am because I can't do any of this without God. I can't mother. I can't wife. I can't be a grandma. I can't be a friend. I can't. Uh, I can't make a living. I can't, I can't do a God-blessed thing without God <laughs> blessing me. <gasps> that is the truth, and that's what comes with character that's being developed. God walked with Joseph for 13 years of testing. 13 years of testing. Some of us are crying and bellyaching over six months of testing. 13 years developing his character for a great dream to be fulfilled. And like Joseph, God sees you in your hidden places, in your obscure places where you think nobody's noticing. God's noticing. And God's saying, this is good. Your tears are for good. Your suffering is for good. You've not been overlooked. I'm with you right there where you're at. And I'm still going to fulfill your dream. I'm getting you ready for your dream. God doesn't lead you into a trial and then step back and say, let's see how Cindy does. That's not God. God steps forward and says, let me hold you in the palm of my hand. Let me sustain you. I'll help you. You don't have to do this by yourself. You can do it through Christ who's going to strengthen you. Nothing is impossible with God on your side.
He steps into our prison, steps into our pits, steps, steps into our hidden places. And he gets us ready for our dream. Amen. Is this good news? I mean, put your hope hat on the day because I'm telling you, I'm bringing you some hopeful news this morning because we're going to start dreaming some big dreams with God this year. We're going to see God glorified in so many ways. So I'm going to answer this question in the next five minutes. What role do dreams play in our life? Because the Bible talks about it. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, it says young men are going to dream dreams. Old men are, I'm sorry, young men are going to, See visions, old men are going to dream dreams. So I'm going to say, I'm an old woman right now. I'm going to dream some dreams with the Lord. Are dreams just a carrot that God holds out and says, here, chase after this, but you'll never obtain it? No, that's not what God's doing. He's not saying reach for the impossible, but you'll never see it happen. He's saying reach for the impossible and watch what I will do. Are dreams just wishful thinking? Oh, no. Dreams are much more. Thank God Starbucks was open this morning. (laughs) God's dreams are so much more for you. This is the role of dreams. God uses dreams to show us the direction we need to be headed. It's not a destination. It's a direction. God will give you a dream in your heart, so you will start walking by faith in the right direction. Step by step. See, the Bible says he orders the steps. He doesn't order the leaps into our success. He orders the steps, line upon line, little by little. I'm moving in the right direction. I'm not off taking a detour in the wrong direction because I have a dream out in front of me. I don't know how I'm going to get there. It's not my destination, but it is the process. In the process of my dream, my dream becomes larger. It becomes bigger, and I see it fulfilled because the process to get there, God is sustaining me. God is with me, and he's shaping me and molding my character so I can handle the bigness of the dreams that he wants to do through our lives. I know what the devil's whispering in your ear right now. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You're nobody. I'm telling you right now, that is a lie from the pit of hell. You are the chosen generation. You live here in this time for a purpose. And dreams are what's going to get you going in the right direction. And then line up on line, step by step, God is going to propel you forward. Okay, if you're going to take any notes today, here it comes. You ready? Dreams propel. Suffering prepares. It again. Dreams propel. Suffering prepares. Character protects. God promotes. So our dreams propel us in the right direction. We're shooting off in the right direction because we have a dream. Suffering prepares us. It prepares us to endure. James chapter 1 verse 3 says, testing of your faith produces endurance. I'm going to be able to make it all the way. No matter what comes, no matter what obstacle or mountain I have to climb, I'm going to be able to endure because I've been tested. I'm not going to lose hope. I'm going to endure. I'm going to be faithful, faithful, faithful so I can be fruitful. Then character protects. Character is what protects us from all temptations. It gives us spiritual muscles to fight the good fight of faith. It protects you. It protects your heart. It protects your dream. Character is what protects us. And then finally, God promotes us. Promotion doesn't come from the east or the west. It comes from the Lord. Your promotion is not connected to a person, place, or thing. Listen to me. People are not your stepping stones. Who you're connect, the, the world says it matters who you're connected with because that's what's going to get you to where you need to go. Uh, 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 uh. That's the world's way. We're doing this God's way. God alone is going to lift you up to success. God alone will lift you to success. I hope you're listening to me. I'm looking around this room, and I see so many people of destiny. And you need to be nodding your head yes, saying, I got this. I'm going to dream, and it's going to propel me in the right direction. I'm going to suffer, so it prepares me. I'm going to develop my character, so it protects me. And then I'm going to let God be the one who promotes me. I don't have to stand here and say, notice me. God is going to promote me. You humble yourself, and God will exalt you. That's what the Word of God says. So God's dreams propelled Joseph in the right direction. Do you think he ever would have popped himself over into Egypt on his own? No. 
but the dream propelled him there. Joseph's suffering prepared his character so he could handle the responsibility of a prime minister that saved a world during a great famine. His character protected him from sinning. You know that when he met his brothers once again, his character protected him so much that he met them with forgiveness and love and grace. Nothing but good for them. That doesn't happen normally. Let me tell you, when people betray you and hurt you, you, you're like, don't let the door hit you on the way out, girlfriend. But when you walk in the character development of God, you're like, Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then Joseph was promoted from a young little 17-year-old dreaming in his father's house to the prime minister of Egypt. That was all God's doing. There's no way that that could have happened without God. See, our dreams are not one-dimensional. We think of dreams, I bet you we were doing this at the beginning of this message at least, that dreams are cars and boats and homes and houses and health and happiness and kids and grandkids and, and just one-dimensional things. You know, great salaries, position, power, prestige. But that's not what dreams are. God's dreams for us, like they were for Joseph, are generational. They're eternal. They're everlasting. They're bigger than just you. It's not just about you. I didn't realize this till just recent years. But we serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And what he started yesterday continues to my today and into my tomorrow. So you got to start dreaming bigger because what you're doing in this generation matters for the generation to come. I don't know how much longer it's going to be till Jesus comes back, but I'm telling you this. I want to leave my kids and my grandkids serving God and fighting and advancing the purposes of God just like I am too. And I want to to carry on because I'm telling you right now if I shared some of the dreams that God placed in my husband's heart when we planted this church it's so big and it's not about building a big entertainment center for the world it's about building a church that Jesus is building and the things that are in his heart we have not seen happen yet but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen it may happen before we go to heaven but it may not it may carry on to the next generation But that doesn't mean we don't hold our baton and serve with faithfulness and then pass the baton so the next generation doesn't have to go back and walk through the snow on the way to school like we did. Are y'all with me? We're going to dream some big dreams that are generational. Genesis 37.2 says the story of Joseph. uh, 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 That's not what it says. The story of the family of Jacob. It was a story about the entire family. Family. It wasn't the story of Joseph. It was the story of the family. Abraham had a dream. God gave him a dream and said, you're going to have a promised son. And out of that son is going to be so many sons and daughters. They will outnumber the granules on sand. Jacob, his, his own father, had a dream a couple cha- about seven chapters before. He has a dream of a staircase going up and down from heaven and angels going up and down. And if you read that passage, and I won't have time to read the whole thing, but in Genesis 28, 13 through 15, it says, at the top of the stair, the Lord stood and says, I am the Lord your God, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac, and And then he goes on to describe the same dreams his father and his grandfather and his great-grandfather had. The same dream is carrying on. I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to make you a people and a nation. And out of you, I'm going to save the entire world. And then he finishes it off in verse 16. He goes, I won't leave you until. Y'all with me there? Look at the end. I won't leave you until it is finished. Everything that I promised you is done. I love that. Joseph's dream was a promise for generations to be fulfilled in future generations. Yes, Joseph was blessed. Yes, the people of the world were blessed during his generation, but it was bigger than that. God was advancing his kingdom purposes for our generation today. It started way back then because, let me tell you, it was out of their lineage. Jesus was born So important. See, God does everything in such perfect order, doesn't he? You're not an accident. You're not forgotten. Just because you're in a hidden place or feeling obscure today, that's the perfect time to start dreaming with God once again. It doesn't matter if you're 60 years old like me or if you're six years old in Kids Rock right now. God 
has a purpose for our lives. And it's so much bigger than what you're dreaming for yourself. We're out of time. I'll close with this, Psalms 126.1. This is the verse I'm memorizing this week. This is your homework for New Year's. You ready? Psalms 126.1. When the Lord restored, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, Zion is a reflection of the church, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations. In other words, the world started talking about us. And this is what they said. Look, the Lord has done great things for them. And they replied, yes, the Lord has done great things for us. And we are filled with joy. Lord, we, we come before you this morning and we ask that as we close out one year and begin anew, that this is a time when we can reboot ourselves and get in sync with you that we would stop dreaming our puny little dreams and start dreaming your grand, great dreams that not only bless our lives and the lives of our families, but Lord, will build in advance your kingdom purposes for our homes, for our city, for our church. Do I dare say for our nation and for our world? Lord, here we are. Use us. Drop your dreams into our heart. We're listening. We're responding by faith. We're going to steer our direction toward that dream. And we're going to say yes every step of the way. May you be exalted as we start this new year. Lord, we love you. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right now with every head bowed, I just would invite you to to ask Jesus into your heart. Don't start another year without him. Don't live another day without him. He loves you. He sees you. He died for you, and he lives for you today. He's coming back for you. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, you can do it right now. Just pray and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Save me right now. Set me free from my sin, and let me be part of your beautiful family, your church. God, we love you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.